Good morning, good morning everybody and welcome to the Sunrise Safari on this very, very chilly winter's day. It's 9 degrees Celsius, 49 degrees Fahrenheit and as far as we're concerned that is Baltically, Antarctically freezing. We've been out for the last five minutes feeling very sorry for ourselves. My name is James Hendry, on camera today we have David. David has got some spectacular gloves on his face, at least on his hands, and a large balaclava around his head, owing to the cold. On the other vehicle, Byron Sarau is driving around with Brian, who will have at least 47 jackets on today, and a, probably an ice-coloured thumb this morning. Now, you are on a live safari if you're wondering who this fellow is blethering to you and from where in the world he's doing it. We're in the middle of the Kruger National Park, iconic wildlife area. And we're on a live safari for the next three hours, and you're most welcome on the back of what is sometimes termed the largest safari vehicle in the world, which I suppose is quite a good uh, sort of a symbol for what we are. We're going to try and find a leopard this morning. There was one calling around here today, early this morning, just as the sort of light, the dawn turned a little bit grey. Please talk to us during the course of the next three hours. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. Your questions and comments, especially if they're amusing, will help us to have a bit of a giggle and warm up because it really does feel much colder than nine degrees out here. Right, so the leopard was calling down there. Let's ease down the road and see if we can find his tracks on the road. We might just find him walking straight towards us, which would be a wonderful bonus. Here we go. Like I say, you're in the Kruger in northeastern South Africa. And we're on a little place called Juma, which is a piece of the Sabi Sand Game Reserve, which is a collection of privately owned farms here on the western fringes of the Greater Kruger National Park. So between us and the Mozambican border, about 60 kilometers of wildlife land, the park extends into Mozambique to the east and north into Zimbabwe. And together they make up three and a half million hectares of land. Or eight and a half million acres. I'm just going to look at something here that looks... Just check the road and see if there are any tracks here going down. Roads, of course, often major arterial routes for territory marking cats, like leopards or lions. They often use roads or very obvious game paths, quite unlike their more timid counterparts, the cheetah, which will normally cross a road and just sort of skulk through the bush, hoping to be avoided or hoping to avoid. Let's go down this way. We might be very lucky. Go ahead, Lex. I'm just going to talk on the radio to Lex quickly. He's the one who heard the leopard. Lex, nothing yet. I'm just turned on to Central from um, Mvubu Road. All right, let's head across to Byron, get an update from him and his plans for the morning. I'll keep you posted what happens here. Good morning everybody and welcome again to Safari Live. My name is Byron and with me on camera I've got Brian and the thumb. Hi Brian. Oh and it is a chilly morning this morning. <laughs> Luckily I've got my gloves, beanie, so I should be okay and scarf. Brian is well covered behind me. Hope you all had a good evening or wherever you are around the world that you're having a great time. It's fantastic to have you live again with us this morning. Yesterday we had a really, really exciting afternoon, a lot of activity. So my plan for this morning is, yesterday afternoon we had a single lioness who we think is probably from the Nkuma pride. And on our way back after we left her and after we left our viewers, we bumped into a male lion at the uh, Buffalshook Dam. 
he was calling and I think possibly that's what caused that lioness to move away. I don't think she was too interested in meeting up with him. We are going to head back into that area and see if we don't have any luck in finding either the male or that lioness and see if there has been any activity in that area this, uh, from last night. While we are driving, constantly trying to check for tracks, see if there's any sign of wildlife that's been moving through the area. Hope all of you enjoyed our Facebook session last night, our live Facebook session. Um, I thoroughly did. It was my first one. It was nice to sit with James and, and Brian, have a bit of banter around the camp and, uh, and answer some of your questions. Hopefully we have another one before I leave in the next week. sure James has given you the temperature this morning already it's it's about nine degrees it, it feels a bit bit cooler but I think that's with the wind chill factor that we experience on drive which uh, which is quite quite cold but it's not too bad I, to be honest I really enjoy uh, I enjoy this uh, this temperature winter for me in the bush is fantastic uh, animals move around a little bit longer during the day because it's much cooler they don't go and hide in the shade of trees. Uh, just have a look here. So a question from book dealer. I'm assuming that came through via Twitter. And the book dealer would like me to try and find them a tower of giraffe. We will try our best. Let's see what you never know. Uh, yeah, I actually haven't seen a giraffe since I've been here in the last two days. So it would be wonderful to see some giraffe around. We'll definitely have a look for any sign. Let's see if, uh, if they stick their heads out. <laughs> Thank you again to everyone for the wonderful comments and and um, and all the support from all the viewers. It was it's fantastic to to hear that you're all enjoying it. I'm really enjoying being with you. Uh, this is a very new concept for me, but it's it's amazing. And to be able to take so many viewers around the world on a live safari is incredible. While I'm moving along this boundary road and looking for any tracks with Brian, why don't you go and have a look what James has for you? We will be stopping this morning at absolutely everything that has a heartbeat until the sun is warming my face and David's face, which is covered with a very sort of modern balaclava. There are some impartial. You can see that they are not too having any kind of central heating. I mean, our rooms have, uh, they're not even insulated. And that's not a problem out here. It's absolutely fine. And so we don't heat our rooms. We just put a blankie over ourselves. And if it's very cold at night, um, no, you know, even if it's very cold at night, a blanket and a, and a duvet is perfectly sufficient. Unless you're David, in which case you have a very large portable air conditioning unit and the room pumped up to 85 degrees Fahrenheit with a, with a roommate hanging out of the window going <laughs> it's better than being cold, It is better than being cold, David, I agree with you.
Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Sorry about that everyone, not sure what happened, no one's probably sure what happened. Anyway, we're back now and uh, you've missed nothing. I'm hoping to show you a bit of the pinkening sky. It looks very really pretty indeed and I think we're probably in for one of those glorious low felt winter days with deep blue skies and pleasant warmth during the middle of the day. Let us find a spot, David, where we might reveal the African sunrise, which is always so very marvellous, even when it is a little bit chilly. There it is, everyone. Kirsten, go again with that last transmission, please. There we are. Is that not very pretty indeed? Ah. And let's just have a listen. For a little while. Very quiet dawn chorus today. One oriole to the left. You can hear the odd hornbill going and they'll be sitting on the tops of the trees hoping for the sun to pop up. They love to sit on the top of trees and catch the first rays. And down in the valley of the great Mulwati calls the first crested Franklin. Very, very pleasant sound, I must say. It's so peaceful. Perfect Saturday morning. All right, Darby, let's drive gently along. No leopard tracks yet. We might be lucky. We might not. We never know what's going to be around the next corner as the safari live cliche goes. But it really is very true. Alright, let's go back to Byron, get an update from him. He's sort of heading towards the north like that and we'll catch up with you shortly. Welcome back everyone. So, uh, Brian and I have been driving around looking for any sign of lions from the hill that we had for yesterday afternoon. We had tracks of a, a single lioness, possibly that lioness we had at uh, the Biffles Hook Dam last night, but they unfortunately have crossed our boundary and headed further north onto Biffles Hook. But I still ha I haven't seen any tracks of the, the males around. So there's a, a very good chance that they could still be in this area. We're having a good look and uh, we're heading towards Biffles Hook Dam now. It's still very, very cool and it is still quite early. So often in the, in the colder conditions, I've found in the past predators, even though they are more active in the early mornings, they will go and lie down a little bit and wait for a little bit later in the morning and then start moving again. You know, they've probably been moving around quite a lot during the evening. Uh, you know, I often think we, we miss so much at night. And these animals do just what they want. They go wherever they like. And, uh, and I think we, we don't really get to see all the, the behavior that we, we hear about or read about because they do most of it in the middle of the evening. <coughs> Janet made a comment earlier about all the beautiful colours and uh, I touched on it yesterday afternoon too, especially with that afternoon light. The colours in the bush at the moment are fantastic and as Brian pans through and has a look you can see beautiful yellows and oranges and greens. 
Excuse me. And that's what I love about doing this too, is we can always appreciate other things that are going on around and, and not just the wildlife. So Andy and Julia from Los Angeles would like to know how long a regular safari lasts and do guests actually stay on the vehicle for three hours like Safari Live? Andy and Julia, yes, there's, there's no set time for a safari, uh, but generally it's between three and four hours long. That I would say is an average time for a safari. Most places though, it also all depends on what you're seeing and how the morning or afternoon is going. It could be a bit shorter, it could be a, long, a, a bit longer, but, um, but generally it's between three and four hours. And time flies while you're driving around through the bush. We would also do uh, short little stops, and get the guests out to stretch their legs a little bit. Uh, in the mornings we stop and do a tea or coffee break. You get a nice hot cup of coffee and a rusk or a, um, or a, a, a biscuit. Just something to, to keep, keep you going until breakfast. <coughs> I seem to have something in my throat this morning. Still no sign of any lion tracks, but we are getting closer to Buffalzook Dam. This takes some getting used to, the driving and looking for tracks and looking for animals. Um, I've done a lot of tracking in, uh, in my time as a guide, but in a lot of places that I've worked at in the past, we, we drive with trackers and a track and guide relationship is so important. And it, um, it makes it a lot easier for the guide. The guide is there to interpret the bush to the guests and a tracker is there to help spot and then find tracks while you're driving. So it does make it much easier, but this is a new challenge and it's fun and it's exciting. Back at Buffalzook Dam. So last night this lioness walked up the road in that direction that we just came from. And the male came through and lay on the dam wall exactly where that lioness was laying just before. So he must have heard exactly where she was calling from and went and investigated to see if she was around. Let's just have a good look around here, see if there are any tracks. I wouldn't be surprised if he decided to follow her. Okay, so here are the lioness tracks from last night. Uh, the resident hippo is still there. <clears throat> so Shamsun has asked about the lioness which we saw last night and whether or not I think she possibly headed to a den. Uh, it, it's a good question, Shamsun. Um, I'm not too sure. I unfortunately don't know the the prime dynamics here very well just yet. I was chatting a bit to, to James last night, and maybe you can ask James a little bit later too. But it does it does look like that female is potentially lactating. She did have um, quite quite large uh, uh, teats, so it did look like she was carrying a bit of milk. So it is a possibility, and for her to be alone like that is also a good sign that she may be either looking for a den or has in fact given birth and has hidden the cubs in a den site somewhere. And that would also explain why the other two lionesses, which I think are from the same pride, we bumped into them last night too on the way back to, back to camp. But they were about, I would say, two or three kilometers from here as the crow flies further west. So it's interesting. So she's obviously moved off for a reason, but it's not to say that she wouldn't meet up with those lionesses again, especially when they're hunting. 
will make it easier for her to get some food. She still has to eat, and then she will return back to the den site and feed those cubs and allow them to suckle. Oh, beautiful sunrise over the water. Oh, look at that. Dove calling in the background. Oh, wow, amazing. <clears throat> Beautiful African sunrise. So as you can see, we have a very, very difficult job. <laughs> um, I could think of of worse offices to be sitting in right now. Oh, fantastic. Really beautiful. It also helps to sit and listen for a while in places like this. Maybe pick up on alarm calls or predators calling. Again, it's still nice and early, so you might still get quite a bit of activity from them. And Nothing just yet. <clears throat> I think let's carry on going. I'm gonna take this road behind us. That male that we had last night lay down here and then I think he he would have possibly got up and moved further down in this direction, a little bit further south. see tracks of that lioness at the moment which we had that walked past us I don't see tracks of the male coming through there maybe uh, tracks of other lions here and there's a track of a male it looks like Difficult. You've got to really have a good look around and see uh, and see um, what what uh, what activity is happening, which direction they're going. While I have a look at these tracks, head over to James, get an update from him, and we'll see you shortly. Right here, we did Hyena Road, uh, which is where you last saw us. Now we're heading south down the Gauri Cut Line. It's called. And we're just trying, still trying to find tracks of the leopard that was calling this morning. Haven't found anything here. So what I'm going to do is just do one last squiz through this area. And then we're going to head towards the hyena den and see if we can't catch the little ones coming out to warm themselves in the early morning sun. That would be very nice indeed. We did see a couple of hornbills, predictably sitting on the top of a tree waiting for the first rays. And the first rays there, you'll see them catching my face now. Yeah, it's very nice. Not quite warm yet, but they'll get there. I think we're in for a delightful day. Hello, Faria and Dr. Bob in New Jersey. You're interested in animals that might be sort of differently distributed during the winter and summer months. In, ma in mammals, no. Faria and Dr. Bob, we don't really get a different distribution of mammals. They do cluster slightly differently, so the herds generally get a bit bigger. They'll move in more sort of conglomerated groups, so I guess today evening we found about, I think there were probably about 30 zebra in one herd uh, up on Cheetah Plains. Uh, buffalo herds generally get up to sort of 400 at this time of the year. Elephant herds also, from their little matriarchal groups, will get to those much larger agglomerations of up to 100 in this area. But in terms of actually different species, no. 
it's unlikely that we see different species around here according to the weather because of the provision of artificial water. So there's no migration in and out of the area. Animals are generally sedentary and make do with what they can here. Obviously though, when we talk about animals, we must include things like birds. And yes, we know that there are many migratory birds that disappear from here during our winter months. And they're either intra-African migrants, which means they go up north of the equator to sub-Saharan Africa. Otherwise, they're Palearctic migrants, which uh, disappear all the way up into Europe and sometimes as far as Siberia and the Arctic, which I think is a remarkably long way to go to get a meal. Anyway, some of the birds have to do that. And then, of course, I mean, animals also must include all the invertebrates and all the insects and things which just don't occur in the winter time at all. And one of the most notable examples, of course, that quintessential sound of the summer from just about all over the world, that of the cicada. No cicadas around during the winter months at all. I was rather hoping there might be a leopard in the, draped in this beautiful ebony tree here. Hello, <laughs> hello NH native, um, I'd love to know what the NH stands for. <laughs> As we sit here complaining bitterly about the cold and you can see the air uh, condensation coming out of my mouth as I brave the cold here. Um, you want to know how long our winter season lasts? Not very long. Um, May is just a beautiful month. June's coldish. July is coldish like this. After July, it's warm again. So while the dry season lasts much longer, the dry season will last from sort of May to often the end of October, which is a long time. And the actual coldness only persists probably for two months and it really it's not that cold at all um, it's very pleasant in the middle of the day i'm just going to turn the radio down slightly And Shamsan, you were obviously watching yesterday afternoon when <laughs> we stopped to look at a Melba finch or a, uh, also known as a green-winged pytilia and <laughs> a leopard walked straight past. So you say, why don't we just stop and look at a bush with a bird in it and maybe a leopard will walk past. I think it's an excellent idea, especially if that bush happens to be in the sun. Oh, there's some lovely big earth moving equipment. That's fun to see. Um, these are about to be used to modify the Juma Dam onto which the Juma Dam cam looks. But unfortunately, one of their colleagues, the third member of their, of their team, is uh, now stricken on the Biffles Hook cut line. It's lost something, some piece of its deeply complicated mechanics. And so these chaps are having the weekend off. Morning, fellows. Very nice to see you, yes. A little bit out of place, but you won't be here for long. Now, Lex thought he heard the leopard heading this way, and I've yet to see any further tracks. So let's go to the hyena den, and let's see what we can find there. Just keep an eye on the Juma Dam cam over the course of the morning. Leopard might pitch up there for a little bit of a, you know, a morning coffee, if you like. Yeah, nice one from Brian there. Brian, you say, is there any chance that the leopard that Lex heard calling could be Sindile? Um, now, for those of you who don't know, Sindile is a 20-year-old male leopard who's just come back to the area uh, after an extended period in rehab for rabies. He's fine. He's, he is too young, Ryan. You're absolutely correct. You say, could he be calling? No, it's highly unlikely that a leopard of two years old is going to be calling. And if he is, he's going to get himself into trouble because the dominant male of the area, who at the moment is Tingana, if he hears that leopard calling and sort of asserting himself and marking territory, then he'll definitely come and give him a hiding. So a leopard will only call if he is trying to assert himself, if he's trying to mark his territory. And for Sindila to be trying to lay out a territory at his current age would be A, suicidal, and B, very unlikely.
He's simply not big enough. His body won't be telling him to do it yet, I don't think. Gosh, it is, a, it is chillsome in these little dips. I don't know where this thing went. He may have just gone down to ground somewhere in that drainage line that next to that big ebony tree that we were sitting next to. But otherwise, everything is out hiding. Let's see if we can make some success with the hyenas. I can see many hyena tracks going back towards their little home, which is not too far up the road from here. So with any luck, they'll all be frolicking about. What was that? Did you get that? Go to Brown. OK. Um, apparently, we're going to go ba back across to Byron for an update as we go through this rather difficult section. We'll see you at the hyena den. James has been heading over to that hyena den quite regularly. I hope he has some more luck there and has those little cubs coming out. We're still having a look for some lion tracks. Had some male tracks at the, at the Buffelsook Dam, try to follow them. It seems like they cut through a block south from the dam. Now we are just driving around to see if we get any sign of them coming out. Tracking is, uh, is not always easy and you really need to know what you're doing. It is a fine, fine art. But what does help is if you drive sections of blocks, you drive around an area and then you can see, hopefully, you'll be able to see if the lines have crossed out of that area or if they are still in there if you don't have tracks coming out. It makes it a little bit easier. This is the exciting part, the looking for the animals, not knowing where they are or what's going to pop up. So Shamsun has asked us about whether or not if you go to a safari lodge um, on safari as a guest, do they take you on, on drives out through the day and also on bushwalks and tracking? Yes, Shamsun, they do. Most places do do it. The guides are all, uh, well, hopefully when you start guiding, they, they go through a series of qualifications that they have to get. And once you have quite a bit of experience, you're able to walk guests in a big five area like we are in at the moment. Um, someone like Stefan, who does a lot of walking, is a, is a good example. He's got all the right qualifications and uh, he is able to take guests on walks. I do the same. James can do it. So if we do guide guests at other lodges, then uh, we definitely do bush walks with them. It's a great way to get out, stretch the legs. You see and hear a lot of the stuff that you miss occasionally from the vehicle. Look at the smaller things, you never know. You can also bump into some of the bigger wildlife while on foot, which is very exciting. We have a, a question from Joburg to Kili, and the question is, if you cycle in a lion in an area where there are lions, are they likely to attack you? <laughs> I'm not sure if this is one of my friends back home that is sending me a, a, a question, because I think they are doing a cycle race from Johannesburg to Kilimanjaro for charity, but uh, they Generally, you have to be very careful if you are cycling in a big five area, not just of lions, but of any animals. The, uh, the one thing is, is that generally animals are more afraid of us than we are of them. But when you're on a bicycle and if you do cycle in an area where there, are, where there is wildlife, you've got to be very, very careful because you can sneak up on them. They wouldn't necessarily hear you as much as they would if you were walking. You'd make far more noise walking than you do on a bicycle. It's unlikely that the lions would necessarily attack you. Uh, again, they'd probably get a fright and most likely run off, but you always have to be careful. And generally, if you are cycling in an area like this, you would have a guide with you that would be able to tell you exactly what to do if you come across any, any of that, uh, 
any of those animals. Just need to wipe the screen quickly. Brian, how's it looking there? It's so foggy. <laughs> <laughs> foggy, all this cold air this morning. How's the thumb this morning, Brian? Handling the cold? It's, it's falling off, it's so cold. <laughs> <laughs> so so James has just got to the hyena den. Why don't you go and have a look what he has got there for you? Unsurprisingly, a hyena at the hyena den. But quite surprisingly, only one hyena at the hyena den. No doubt her two little babies are just inside there. And yesterday we had the most wonderful sighting of the two little ones. Can't be more than 10 days old, I don't think sitting inside and they came out and they suckled and they played around a little bit before disappearing back inside. We also had one of what I think was the January babies knocking about. I don't know where the other one is. Don't know where the rest of the clan is. And the fact that they're not here and the fact that those youngsters are not here tells me that I'm just not convinced that this is actually where everyone's hanging out at the moment. I think there might be a third den possibly behind us in that drainage system between here and the one that's on um, Gallagher Shortcut. She's definitely low ranking. She's given birth here. There are one or two who come and see her. They spend a bit of time here and then they seem to duck off because at the main den, remember where we had Madam and her babies, everyone centered there. The activity of, was always centered there. There was never a time when there was no one around. And so I'm not convinced that this is the main den yet. I think she's still lurking around here because her babies are a little bit young to introduce to the rest of the clan. I think it's going to be worth our while to sit here just for the next five minutes or so, see what happens, see if anything pops out. If it doesn't, we'll continue. But at the moment, no other prospects. So I think a good idea to just sit here for a while. It's never a bad thing in the bush to sit and be quiet. Or not be quiet, but to sit and just wait. Something always walks past. And it's one of the reasons animals like this hyena, although she's sleeping now, will seldom sleep soundly. They'll always lift their heads up and look around. There's never anywhere that you can sit and not be noticed by something at some stage. Although she doesn't seem to be that panicked by life at the moment, does she, David? Not quite. So at the moment, we know that the clan consists of at least 16 adults or so. And we also know that there are two December babies, two from last year, two January babies from this year, a November baby from last year, and a couple of June babies, no, one June baby as well from last year. Now they would all, in theory, the June baby now moving with the clan, so it wouldn't... ...centering on wherever the clan's central den is at the moment. Now we checked the one off Gallagher shortcut the other day, it's definitely nothing going on there. So it's difficult to say what's going on. Hello, Erlene. Um, it was a nice question from you. And I'm just thinking about how it actually happens. So you say, would a low-ranking female like this ever think about leaving the clan, perhaps, and going to start her own clan? I think that might happen with a high-ranking female. I don't think it would happen with a low-ranking female. I think it would be unlikely that she would have the gumption to go off and try and sort of dominate other hyenas. But a very high-ranking female, if uh, it became obvious that there was a dearth of hyenas in a particular area, well, then she might settle off in, a, in another area. I think you'd find what would happen is, let's say um, 
Let's use, for example, that the this this clan of hyenas um, was decimated by something, right? So they, they disappeared. This territory became immediately empty. And the very large clan of hyenas that lives on elephant plains and occupies Arethusa, let's pretend then that they will then there's an opportunity for them to spread. I think it's quite likely that uh, one of the high-ranking females there might sort of go foraging or the, one of the males might come foraging here, find that there was no one around um, and they'd slowly spread into this area and you'd find that once the territory got big enough, the clan would split and one of the dominant females in that clan would take over as the matriarch of a new clan. I think that's probably how it would happen, far more than a low-ranking female like this going away, simply because she doesn't uh, have the self-confidence, I don't believe. Hello, Sandy. Um, nice one about whether they have anything to worry about. This hyena doesn't seem to have a worry in the world um, because they move in groups. Sandy, they are, I mean, the predator hierarchy here, the top five predators basically go in this order. Lion, hyena, wild dog, leopard, cheetah. And this lions and spotted hyenas often are interchangeable depending on their numbers and it's because they're big and it's because they're in groups so the bigger the hyena group uh, the more chance it has of sort of becoming the apex predator and so they don't worry about a great deal they absolutely worry about lions and they worry about other hyenas uh, this hyena would worry about a big male leopard that came wandering through here if it was found on its own she would worry about it, but not to the extent that she would feel the need to run away. She may well um, turn and challenge a leopard, because a leopard is on his own, so he's never going to take the chance. Even though he's much bigger than she is, and he's stronger than she is, he's not going to take the chance of getting injured, because he doesn't live in a group. And that passes on to the next part of your question. They always seem to be stealing food from everyone else, you say. They don't actually steal food from everyone else all the time. They do a huge amount of hunting. Um, especially in East Africa. Not so much here, they do scavenge quite a lot here. Something's coming. It's another hyena. Wonderful. Here we go. Let's see who this is. Just off through there. This looks like the young hyena that's been lying out away from the den every time we've come in here. Let's see if they greet each other and how fondly they greet each other. There we go. Approaching very cautiously. Come on then, come and say hi. Don't be shy. Very nervous. Ooh. Dear, yeah, that's fascinating. I don't know what precipitated that. And she's pushing home that attack. I'm just going to look with my binoculars and see if I can't tell who that is and if I can't what sex he or she is. Looks too big to be a male. definitely not flavor of the month and our mother is very unhappy to see him huh. that's very interesting I couldn't begin to tell you what happened there they're still around the corner just out in the Sun and I don't know I mean, nothing's going to come out of the den now. We might just try and sneak around the corner there and see what's going on. Let's try that. Shamsan, nice one from you also about low-ranking hyenas and uh, yearling hyenas and whether they pose a threat to new cubs. Shamsan, no, I think almost universally not. 
although they're low ranking, they're hyena, it's still a, a, a tightly knit group. The greatest danger, of course, to a hyena cub is a hyena cub sibling who may well try and kill it at birth. And so that would be the greatest sort of danger to a young hyena cub. But that doesn't appear to have happened here. There still seem to be two of them, and I think they'll probably both survive now. And that's not unusual for a low-ranking female's cubs. June and November are on their own. They probably were born with siblings, so they may well have killed their siblings. Sorry, John, I missed your question. I was waffling on about the last question. I'll get it back from you. Uh, you say, does it, would a low-ranking female's youngsters automatically become low-ranking? Yes, they do automatically become low-ranking. It's precisely what happens, John. The, the clan hierarchy is maintained very violently and very definitely. We're going to wait here. The hyenas are just up ahead. Looks like the mother wants to come back here. And just, sorry, Dave, just look over there. There's a crested Franklin about to go down into the hole where the little cubs are. That's where the little cubs are. So, John, it is precisely what happens that a low-ranking female will inherit the status of their mother. Look, here they come. Here we go. Just looking at Dave's balaclava. He looks like a criminal, so she's a bit nervous. where her little babies are. And the other one is now coming down the right-hand side of the car, over there. She's just, while we look at that one, I'm just going to narrate what's going the other one. She's just stuck her head into the den site. Maybe she'll call out the youngsters. Now, let's try and find out if this one coming past us is a male or a female. It's not unusual for males to come past and say hi at the den, even though they're all low-ranking compared to the females. Now, I can't tell. This looks like a male to me, maybe. But a youngster. Uh, maybe a young female. It is very difficult to tell. There's quite a, a whiff coming out of the place, isn't there? Mm. Ah, thank you, Cla Chris Rogue. Uh, you say that this is clan male number 15. Now, Chris Rogue and a few others have maintained a wonderful group called the on Facebook called the Hyenas of Juma and Arethusa and they have amazing sorry I'm just listening to Ooh. we've got tracks of Karula coming onto Voyatella that's good news all right we'll head that way fairly soon so this is apparently um, a male number five, 15 from Chris Rogue. Thank you very much for that, Chris Rogue. They've got wonderful pictures of all the hyenas and identifying spots. Also known as tsaka, which means happy, basically, or sort of. And you can identify them. Chris and the others identify them from the marks on their bodies. I think, Chris, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you know, from the spots. The spots don't change. And so if you keep, a, keep an eye out, you can tell what's going on. You can see how this male is much more low-ranking than the female. He's not prepared to take a chance with her.
Lex, I'm going to head down that way as well. Uh, I'll come give you a hand. And here he comes again. Look, 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 look. Not happy to have him around. Now, I, look, I, I guess infanticide is a, a possibility. It's not impossible that there could be some form of infanticide where he might um, he might think about killing the cubs because she's low ranking. I think it's highly unlikely though. And you can see how she is so much larger than he is. You say, would she be, Mary Ann Boston, a nice one from you. Sorry, I am just listening to the radio, what's going on with those Karula tracks. You say, would a low-ranking female leave the den to forage? She has to leave the den to forage. And her youngsters would remain safe inside on their little shelf inside the burrow there. She has to go off and she has to go and um, forage on her own and she will do so frequently. And you can see she's got a very full belly, so she's been successful over the last few evenings, I think. All right, let's just see a little bit more what happens here, and then I think we're gonna head down towards those Karula tracks. Let's see if we aren't very lucky there. She's settling down again. The male is still there. I can still see him. Sorry, just cleaning. Just cleaning there. Sandy, you're wondering what the, the hyena den looks like inside and if it's large enough for any male hyenas or any adult hyenas. No, it's not. I don't know what it looks like inside. I was about to make some facetious answer about there being some sort of playpen and a playstation and a, you know, various other, uh, you know, modern modern conveniences for young kids. No, it's it's very small inside. It's big enough for, um, say, a four or five or six month old hyena to go into. But at behind that, I think it gets deeper every time they use it. Behind that, the little ones will dig a shelf for themselves to, to sit on. And so very small in, at the back of the den where the little ones are safe. All right, let's go backwards. Um, we'll just have one last look and then we're gonna head down towards the south. And see if we can't oh quickly sorry Dave just look on that branch over there look at those wonderful crested Franklins just sitting enjoying the early morning light there's one of them it's like they're walking the plank <laughs> I think they're so great, those birds. If I had ever had a farm, I wouldn't mind having some Franklins instead of some chickens. I wonder if they would uh, if they'd produce eggs. I think you'd have to have a lot of Franklins if you wanted the eggs. The male is right here. He's still lurking here. Fortunately, we just ran over a very large tree and the male got a bit of a fright. And Bear, you say maybe this young male here is a, uh, a youngster looking for his mother. I don't think he's that young, um, but he's certainly not, he's not old, and you can tell that from his condition. He's in good condition, he isn't beaten up, and any hyena, once they reach adult or full adulthood or, you know, close to the end of their life, is going to have mangled ears and beaten up feet, because they do fight each other quite a lot. Ease around here. 
sorry, Philada, I mean to give you a fright. And you can see how much more nervous they are than the females, much more. They've got a lot more to be concerned about. And it's so interesting, you know, you see them on their own and they're quite difficult to tell whether one's male or female or not. And then you see them with a female and you see how much smaller they are. He doesn't want us to be sandwiched between us and that rather nasty female. So although she's low ranking, you can see here how she is completely outranks any male. And you just see the colors brightening up so beautifully now. All right, everyone, I think we're going to leave the den now while the Mrs. Hyena goes popping down into the, in there, snoozing. Her youngsters might come out a bit later. This male, I think, will probably find some shade eventually and lie down in that, put some sun initially. But while he does that, let's head down, I think, towards where Karula's tracks have crossed onto Juma. We'd really like to see her again. So let's, while we do that, head across to Byron. I know he's heading towards quite an exciting sighting, and let's get an update from him. So I'm glad you had some luck with hyena and with James uh, at the hyena den. We've got an interesting sighting. So Brian and I were sitting around trying to work out where these lionesses and lions have gone. And uh, we had tracks heading much further south. It sounds like somebody just found two lionesses that are feeding on something. <coughs> we also had some impala alarm calling. We went, we checked around, had a look in the area, but, um, but we didn't have any luck, no sign of anything around there. So what we're going to try to do is get into this area where we think those lionesses are and see what they are up to. Oh, we're just saying it's very, very chilly this morning. While we're driving around here, the temperature has dropped. As the sun has started to rise, the temperature dropped even further. So Anna Marie would like to ask, have I ever been surprised by a big cat uh, approaching quite closely while I was on foot? Uh, yes, Anna Marie, I have. I have uh, quite, uh, quite a few times. Uh, and, and most of the time it's when I've been tracking, looking for the animal, like a leopard or lion. Um, I've walked into many, many big cats in, in my time as a guide. It's just one of those things. But you, you... As long as you're aware and you, you're careful, you generally can back off without them getting too aggressive and they, and they generally calm down quite quickly again. But um, one occasion I had guests, we had stopped for a sundowner and we jumped off the vehicle. And as we were packing everything up, um, we were all standing around the front of the vehicle and one of the guests said, oh, what is that over there? And as I looked behind me, we had a big male leopard walking towards us down the road, which was, which was <laughs> so exciting and quite a big surprise. But it was uh, purely, I think, a case of him just knowing that we were there. He was very comfortable with us. And he walked and quickly got everybody around back onto the side of the vehicle. And he must have walked about 10 meters from us, walked right past. It was incredible. Getting closer to that area where we think these lions are. So, exciting times ahead. You're going to have to help us keep an eye out. <laughs> Don't want to miss anything. Oh, look what we have ahead. Giraffe. We had a question about giraffe this morning. 
Book Diva, these, oh, here is a giraffe for you. You asked for it, and look what we have found. Let's just see, I only see the one. Oh, wonderful. Big male, looks like quite an old male. Let's just see, just keep, keep, keep an eye on it there. Let's follow it a little bit. Look at that. Again, you, you never know what you're going to bump into out here. Now we're looking for lions. We bumped into a giraffe. Oh, that is a big old male. Wonderful. Look at that. Very slow walk down the road. Now, some of you might be wondering, how did I know that that is a male so quickly? Just from seeing it stick its head out and turn and walk onto the road. So, apart from the the, the obvious, uh, the male genitalia, if you don't see that, you can see it sometimes under the stomach of the male. But have a look at those horns, and if we get a little bit closer, right on top of the male's head. So they are known as ossicles or horns and then you can actually see it very clearly. These horns of the male, do you see how bald they are on top? The horns are much thicker and are completely bald on top. The females, their horns or ossicles are much thinner and they've got little black tufts of hair that cover the entire horn right up to the top. And you can see that very, very easily if you do see a male and female giraffe, if you can just see the head. So it's quite easy to tell if it's male or female just by looking at that. Also, this is a very big giraffe. This is a nice old male. He does seem a little bit darker. And that tends to be either a genetic thing or with age. The older giraffe tends to become a little bit darker. But it can also be genetic or area specific. Some giraffe in certain areas might be a little bit lighter than others. We only have the southern giraffe in southern Africa, but up in Kenya, Tanzania, you get a lot more species of giraffe up there. Different species. And look at that. Look, you see he's missing a bit of his tail. That could be a number of things. But often what happens with giraffe is they get a lot of ticks that sit on them and pester them. And occasionally the ticks can be so bad they cause an infection. And I've seen it a few times on the tails of giraffe. And the tips of the tails end up falling off. In other instances, or you could have um, lions trying to, trying to hunt a giraffe, maybe when they're a little bit younger. Look at that beautiful giraffe. Wow. And occasionally lions try and hunt a giraffe and might grab a tail and pull off a piece. But I think in this case it's possibly due to the ticks. You can see clearly again that this is an older giraffe. It's got a lot of calcification on the on the uh, on the head. Can you see those? those lumps or knobs around the head it's that's from also a good sign of age calcification builds up around the skull of the giraffe zoe from australia has asked us how big is a giraffe compared to an elephant so zoe an elephant can get to about sorry joey joey from australia joey asked how big a giraffe is compared to an elephant now height wise a giraffe is much taller. A giraffe will get to about six meters, and I'm almost certain that this big male is about that size. Whereas an elephant, a big male elephant, will probably get to about, uh, it's, uh, I'd say, three meters, three, three to maybe a really big male, four meters, but, but on average, two to three meters tall. He's just hiding in the bushes.
Well, that was a really great surprise. Let's carry on looking for our lions. We're not too far from the area that I think they're in. So let's keep a lookout. But really great to see this big male giraffe walk past us. There he goes. Fantastic. All right, let's keep a lookout for these lions and see what they have got for us. Very excited about this. I think we're in for a treat. Some buffalo dung around this area too. <laughs> Naomi from Pretoria has seen me <laughs> touching the side of the, the steering wheel or the indicator and asked if I'm using my indicator. I'm not. It's, it's, it is a habit, Naomi. I've, I've put my hand on there a few times and thought, wait, I don't need to use it. No, so I don't use it in the bush. We don't have to. Um, but it's, it's pure habits. It's from <laughs> driving vehicles in the cities and, and so on. And uh, it just... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I did it. <laughs> Brian's having a good chuckle at me now too. <laughs> I'm just scanning this area very carefully now, looking to see if we can find these lines. Don't want to miss anything. Oh, the sun is starting to warm us up quite nicely now. Still having a good look. It's uh, nice and open around this area, so we should be able to spot these lions easily, unless they've moved off in, into the thicker bush, but don't worry, I can see there's been a bit of activity on the road. Looks like some running, and I do see one or two line tracks still heading in this direction. Let's have a look. Come on, where are these lions hiding? It's always exciting, you kind of sit on the edge of your seat now, you know something's around, you're just not sure where it is. Oh, there we go, there we go. Fantastic. And they are feeding on something, yes. Okay, let me just get the vehicle in there quickly for us. Looks like two lionesses. Here we go. Wow, they're feeding, oh, they're feeding on a young buffalo. Remember I said we actually had buffalo tracks back there. These look like these two lionesses that we bumped into last night on our way back to camp. Um, I'm not too sure, but I think this might be two lionesses from the Nkuhuma Pride. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Oh, this is incredible.
you know, watch closely while this lioness is feeding. Just something I'd like to point out, which is very interesting. See how she's chewing with the side of her mouth. And she's tearing away at that meat. Now, lions and other big cats have something that is known as a carnassial shear. What that is, is the teeth the, in the back of the mouth, the molars and the premolars. You can see she's chewing there again using those, those teeth. They are slightly sharpened. They end in a sharpened edge and they overlap each other, almost like a scissor motion. And at the back of the jaw, that is obviously where all the very powerful muscles are in the, in the jaw. And they prefer chewing and tearing with those teeth. So that scissor motion with those very sharp teeth and the power allows them to tear and break, um, break the meat down very easily. So that is the carnassial shear. They will still use the front teeth to tear open carcasses, but have a look. You see she's chewing with the side of her mouth there. And the other side. Very interesting to see. Looks like the other lioness has eaten her full. There, Brian's focusing on her now. Look at that belly. That is a full stomach. Lions will gorge themselves on meat. They'll eat as much as they possibly can until they cannot feed anymore. They will then go and lie down and rest, just like this lioness is doing. And a little bit later, she'll probably get up and feed again. And they will constantly do that until there's nothing left of that kill. Once they've eaten everything or all the, the really good meat and there's not much left for them to feed on, they'll move off. And you might get other scavengers coming in, like hyena or potentially vultures, although this is a little little covered and it's not a really large kill so I don't think you would get a lot of vulture activity here but you will get hyena and probably a few jackal coming and scavenging off of the remains shows you how far these, these lions can travel. I mean, the, where we saw them last night, it was right on the other side of the camp, north of here. Um, we're kind of in the southern side of Juma at the moment, and south, southwestern side. And they've traveled uh, good, good four, four kilometers, five kilometers. But they, they can cover a large distance in the evenings, especially. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier. You know, we don't really know how far these animals can travel, uh, only from what we track and find in the morning. But uh, in one evening, they can cover huge distances, very active, and especially they will try and hunt under the cover of darkness. Lions are also ambush predators, so they try to use, use the evening to their advantage and sneak up on prey and, and stalk and hunt. And these lions have been successful. Oh, you can hear the bones crunching. Again, just those powerful jaws and those teeth crunching through some of the softer bones. I want to have a yeah, so this is definitely a young buffalo calf. So James was looking for Carulo. Why don't you cross over to him and see if you've got any updates on that? And we will sit with the lions. Now, hello everybody. That is uh, rather wonderful that you've been watching two lionesses having their breakfast. Uh, obviously a very bad day for the buffalo calf. We've come down very far to the south now. We're actually not far from where you were watching the lioness with Byron and hoping to find tracks of Karula and her cubs. Now, there were reports of them coming onto the reserve. Lex has driven this area and he says he can't find any tracks. And if Lex can't find tracks, I'm deeply suspicious of my ability to find them. 
So I wonder if somebody hasn't made a mistake. So we're just going to turn on to the southern boundary here. This is, of course, where we last saw little Sindile yesterday. Maybe he'll pop back and see if I can't find something here. Then if you're wondering about the Birmingham boys, there are three of them now on Biffle's Hook. Uh, they are eating also a buffalo. And they are with three lionesses, probably that we think of the Torchwood Pride. Now, I have never seen the Torchwood Pride, and their existence is something of a mystery to me, given that they're supposed to live on Torchwood, but that's basically in Kahuma Pride territory. Now, we'll keep an eye out on the road here very carefully. People would have driven up and down here. So, if I don't look you in the eye while I'm waffling away, it's not because I'm being rude. Sandy, very nice question. You were saying you're wondering if the wild dogs have come back into the area. Sandy, they did. They came back onto Vuyatela or Juma for about five minutes, and then they went north into Bufalsuk, and then north from there into the Manyaleti. So they hung around for precisely five or ten minutes, which is obviously deeply irksome to us, but they're not around here anymore. I think they'll come back. I suspect it was a, um, a dispersal pack, simply because I'm pretty sure that the packs, the settled packs, will have given birth and dend now. And for them to be ranging that far, um, unless that maybe they've got a den in the Manileti and they just came down here for a sort of hunting foray, it's quite a long way for them to come. So maybe they're a dispersal pack. Hello, Alan. Very nice question from you. Uh, you say, why have you not seen any rhino? You're a new viewer. It's lovely to have you with us, Alan. And thank you for giving us of your time and especially for talking to us. Alan, we don't see rhino because we don't show you rhino. And it is because of poaching. Uh, we're not, we don't, uh, the chances of a poacher ever watching the show pinpointing where we had seen the rhino and then coming in here or being able to get in here and then uh, wreak havoc is uh, obviously very remote. But at the same time, we just don't want to, if there is a remote possibility of it, we don't want to have anything to do with it. And so that's why we don't show rhino. We do see them from time to time. But I definitely see them far less frequently than I used to in this particular area. And so, yeah, that's the story with the rhino. They are around though. In fact, Dave and I saw one just a little bit earlier. But unfortunately, we won't show them. Hopefully, that, that will change one day and we will be able to see them because they're such special creatures. They really are the most wonderful animals. I'm just keeping an eye on the radio. All right, let's head back to Byron and the Lions. I'll try and figure out what's going on with these tracks here. James hasn't had any luck yet with Karula, but as I always say, it's too soon to panic. He's still sitting with these two lionesses. I heard a sound in the distance, and this lioness also picked up her head and noticed that. It sounded almost like a buffalo. <laughs> Don't hear anything again. So Kathy from Tennessee has asked us if these lions would eat the skin of the buffalo. And Kathy, generally, they, they try not to eat too much of the skin, but they will. Uh, you know, it's, it's inevitable while they're feeding to, to, to feed on some of the skin. As you can see, while that lioness is feeding, she's trying to get more, more closer into the meat underneath the skin, and she's tearing a lot of the skin away. But they will still feed on bits and pieces of the skin. That's often why lion dung has got a lot of hair in it. You can see it if you do find fresh lion dung, there will be a lot of hair in it, and that's from, from the skin of animals, from the fur. Yeah, 
we're just going to have to wipe our lens again. Again, it's misting up a little bit. As as the, the morning starts warming up, you start getting just a little bit of, bit of condensation. Is that correct, Brian? Mm. <laughs> So Alice from Oregon has asked us if lions, let's just see what this lioness does, uh, just changing position. Alice from Oregon asked us if lions only grow one set of teeth. Uh, Alice, I'm not too sure when they are younger, if, if, a, if a new set grows in, I don't I'm not too sure. I'll have to double check that. Or if somebody else has got any idea when they're young, if they do grow new teeth. But I've definitely seen in adults, when adults break their teeth, they don't regrow. Um, the teeth do not grow back. So in adults, they no. Once the teeth are broken, or especially those ca those canines, those incisors, then they they don't grow back. So it is just the one set. See that jaw working and those sharp teeth at the back of the mouth, cutting that meat. See how she's licking the kill. That's interesting. Now, one of the reasons why she would be licking a kill, the lion tongue is incredibly rough, very, very rough. They've got little, almost like barbs, very sharp um, little hairs on the on the tongue, and it's incredibly rough. It's it's almost like sandpaper. You can imagine. With each lick, she's actually loosening some of the hair and also opening that carcass even more just by licking it. I mean, look how the, the fur is sticking to her tongue as she licks it. Wonderful to sit and watch them feeding and, and kind of trying to understand more about the way the lions feed, how they eat. Very interesting. Brian and I are warming up really nicely in the sun at the moment. It's, the temperature has increased quite a bit from this morning. And it is beautiful. Very peaceful morning. Clear, clear blue sky. Warm sun. And even though we're sitting watching lions, as I said, it's, it's so peaceful. Very calm. Soothing. Oh, look at that beautiful view that we've got around here at the moment. Speaking about the, the sun warming us up and on these winter mornings, it really is wonderful. And uh, I've had in the past, I've had one or two guests on the vehicle early on winter's morning the sun warming us up and they uh, have dozed off a little bit and, and I think I don't know if it's because my, my voice is soothing or just because the feeling of the warmth after a cold morning and, and the, the fresh air just makes you kind of nod off a little bit so I've had one or two guests doze off and then when we leave a sighting it's usually when we're sitting in a sighting because it is so peaceful, and then they, they wake up again, and they go, oh, we'll just uh, nod it off for a second, but it's such a lovely feeling. So I don't, I hope it's not because I'm boring. <laughs> so Jim Butler has asked us, how many species will benefit from this buffalo kill, this buffalo calf kill that the lions have made. So Jim, a number of species, it's it's difficult to say for sure, but I'm almost certain that the lions definitely, so that's one hyena, I'm sure once the lions have eventually moved off, possibly jackal, if there are any in, in and around the area. 
you might get something like a, a civet coming through, possibly feeding on little bits, little remains. Um, that 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 could happen. Uh, you'll get possibly a few mongoose coming through, and and maybe one or two birds, uh, little shrikes, maybe coming picking up little pieces of meat that are still around. So maybe five or six species at least that we know of. And then of course the, all the insects afterwards um, that will benefit you know, from the, from the carcass. All tearing away. That lioness is really enjoying that. Still, just got a little bit of moisture on the lens there, yeah, on the and it's unfortunately inevitable. It will it will disappear shortly, I'm sure. Pat in Tampa would like to know if animals in the bush age similarly to animals back home, like dogs or cats. And uh, I think she mentioned that one dog year is equivalent to seven human years. To be honest, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm One human year, seven dogs, sorry. <laughs> and I don't know. To be honest, I don't know how they work that out. Uh, it's uh, I've always found that very confusing. I think animals just have shorter lifespans than, than people do. Um, lions, for example, have a much shorter lifespan. A lioness like this could possibly live to the age of about, uh, on average, between 13 to 15 years. And a big male lion, on average, is about 10 to 12 years. Now, I'm not too sure if that's an equivalent to human years or not. I, I don't think so. Like I said, I think it's possibly just different animals have different lifespans. But again, I, I am not an expert on that. I don't know how they measure it or how they gauge it. Right, I need to open up the lens to get away this fog. I'm going to have to just do it. Okay, so while Brian is quickly going to fix this lens for us, let's go across to James and get an update from him. Hello, everybody. I'm afraid we have found no tracks of these leopards. Um, I'm not sure where the reports came from. While I would completely accept that I had missed them coming across, I don't accept that me and Lex and another chap who just drove past could also have missed them, so I'm really not sure what those reports were. Anyway, I don't think there's any Karula at the moment. We might be lucky. We're going to take a road down towards Treehouse Dam. We'll go and have a look there, and then I think we're going to head across to Arethusa and see if there isn't thing, anything over there. Marvellous that Byron has got those lions. And uh, always a stopgap now we can go to at any stage. Brilliant stuff. Not sure who they are. I wonder, I mean, do they look like Nkuhuma lionesses to you or maybe Styx lionesses? It's quite interesting because. No, they are Nkuhumas, it says Kirsten. Marvellous. Okay, good. Good to know. So, where are the other three is the question. One's on Torchwood, one is probably knocking about Bivelsook Dam. Where's the other? It's all rather mysterious. Lex also did have tracks of wild dogs heading down south uh, into Little Gari. So w just about when, I suppose, when I was talking to you, um, just when I was talking to you, he was finding tracks and they were going along the, that main road that we were on. And unfortunately, they did go south from there, which is a little bit sad. But it is the way of things. 
They do roam so very widely, the wild dogs. Otherwise, David and I have seen a buffalo, a living one, unlike the one you've seen today, which is dead. And we also saw a water buck. Well, I saw it. I'm not sure that David did. David's face is so trussed up with various warming implements that it wouldn't surprise me if he was entirely blind to the day going on around him. That was a not quite that he said there, through four layers. Hello, Karen in Tanzania. You've got me into my grey area again. You've said, do we interfere if an endangered animal is being harmed by other animals? So you know that we would probably interfere, for example, if a wild dog was caught in a snare or if we thought we could uh, help its injury being because it's endangered. And, but you say, well, would we do that with an animal that was um, being hurt by another animal? In theory, no. In theory, no, we'd let things, let things ride. Uh, in practice, however, I think it's quite difficult to let things ride, to be honest. And I would find it certainly extremely difficult were I to come across some lions or something like that. And if I was to find them about to sort of, they were sneaking up on a cheetah or a wild dog, I would find it extremely difficult not to clap my hands and make a noise. And does that do any harm? No, probably not. I don't know. Is it particular? I don't, I don't know. It's where that gray area is. So in theory, we come into this area and we try and have no effect at all. We just observe what's going on around us. But by our very nature of being here, we are interfering. We're here. We are watching. We're driving around in a vehicle. We've created roads. We've created dams. We've created artificial water points. We put up lodges and we're around. When we go into a sighting, the animals, the nature of the situation is irrevocably changed by our being there in a, in a big vehicle. Unless you can view the thing, view animals from, you know, three kilometers up without them having any idea that you're there, it's impossible not to have an effect. So you can't really say when you're looking at an animal whether or not your being there has affected whether or not they would be harmed. So. Yeah, Karen, I, it's that, it's, it's that grey area. I would say yes. For an endangered species, almost certainly we would try and interfere. But it is a, it's a nice, it's a, it's a lovely topic that, and one that has changed. My views on it have changed completely over the years. You know, when I came into here, I was such a purist. When I started in this area, I thought you shouldn't do any land management, you shouldn't have any artificial water, you shouldn't bush clear the bush, you shouldn't be interfering at all. If something gets injured, you let it go. And I would have been scandalized at myself saying, ooh, no, these are civets. Civet tracks, I'm afraid, not baby leopards. I would have been scandalized at myself saying, uh, yes, you know, I might interfere. I don't know. I think it's very personal. And the Sabi Sands, as much as it's it's beautiful, to to describe it as a wilderness, I think is probably a little bit of a stretch, simply because there's so much human activity here. And while it's still a magnificent area, the creatures are amazing. I think they have a very good, comfortable life. It's a it is a conservation hotspot. I think to describe it as a wilderness is a, a stretch and therefore to say that well we, we, we shouldn't have any effect is a bit ridiculous given how much effect we're obviously having. No, I don't see any further tracks. I think we're going to head across to Arethusa. While we do that, let's go back to Byron and his lions. We have managed to clean our lens and one, the lioness that was feeding stood up and just went and lay down and now the other one has got up and looks like she might start feeding. But look how full that belly is, incredible. They really, really have had a lot of meat from this buffalo calf. And these lionesses 
I assume will stay here the whole day. Don't think they will f will leave, but most likely finish this buffalo calf by this evening. The lions can eat a lot of meat. There, there's a potential chance they may still be here tomorrow morning because there is so much food there for them. But you never know. You, they could have hyena coming into the area. There's a lot of hyena activity around here. And if these lionesses are really outnumbered by hyena, they'll probably move off and try and avoid any confrontation. If there was a big male around, um, from what I've seen in the past, hyena generally keep their distance. They don't like those big males because they can do some serious damage and have killed a number of, of hyena in the past. Look at that female also using her carnassial shear. So Chris from Olympia has asked us, do the lions digest the bones that they feed on or do they spit them out? They definitely digest the bones. They, the, the larger bones, Chris, they won't necessarily feed on because they, those are obviously just too big. But the smaller bones, especially the rib bones and that, they will crunch right through those and they will feed on them. Uh, also, the lions get a lot of nutrients from those bones, the marrow which is inside and also the calcium and the phosphorus from the bones is good for these animals. So they do digest all of that and... Um, and occasionally, and you see it a lot with hyena, hyena really feed on, on a lot of bone. And because of that high calcium and phosphorus content, the dung of hyena turns white very quickly after a few days. And it's because of those nutrients in there from the bone. Lions, it may occur, um, but not as quickly and not as much as hyena dung. But yes, they do digest the bone. This lioness is now resting really nicely, full belly, very happy. I can hear some hyena in the distance. It was just a hyena call, but quite far from here. And Tutwa from India has asked if the loss of canines in lions as I mentioned earlier I have seen canines get broken off especially the older the older they get and uh, Tutu has asked with the loss of canines will that uh, p potentially cause them to starve because they're unable to hunt or does it affect them it in my experience and what I've seen it doesn't affect them as much with broken canines and that, there's always still one or two around that they'll, be, that they'll be able to use within their mouth. And as we've been seeing, they use the back teeth far more to feed. So the loss of canines, it does help a bit with hunting and tearing open carcasses, but it won't, it won't cause them to die of starvation at all. There's, and generally, we also need to remember, lions are pride animals. They're, they're very social. So there's always other lions to help with the hunt, and that will then in turn help them to be able to feed. So with the loss of one or two, it shouldn't cause a problem at all. As the other lioness stood up a few minutes ago, we saw there's still a, quite a bit of blood on her paws. So this is definitely a fresh kill from, I don't know if you can see it through there a little bit, the paws are still quite moist. So a fresh kill from last night, maybe even early, early this morning. But judging by the size of those bellies, they've been feeding for a while. This is so great. 
You know, yesterday it was the first time I saw lions on Juma, and now to see them, these two lions this morning with the kill is fantastic. So, Sandy in Missouri would like to know what time of year is the best time to visit and what time is the worst time to visit. So, Sandy, I don't think there's a good or bad time to visit for a safari. You can visit any time of the year. Um, I personally really enjoy, you know, I mentioned this morning, winter for me is lovely in the bush, but I enjoy the secret seasons, we call them. So, kind of... April, May uh, in Southern Africa is very nice. And August, September, those two months are, are quite popular too. But as I said, each season has got something to offer. In the winter, you've got these beautiful colors, cool temperatures, not as many bugs around. Summer, however, you've got the lush green vegetation, a lot more water around. Animals, uh, most of the animals also having a lot of young that time of the year and a lot more bird life. You get a lot of migrants coming back for the summer. So so each season has got its its benefit. So I think I think you should probably visit any time. But maybe try try both seasons and see which you prefer. I think that's the, the most important thing. It all depends what you prefer. Shamson has just asked about hyena and if they would challenge two lionesses for the kill. I mentioned earlier that I think if if a number of hyena came in and because there is such a high hyena concentration in this area, if uh, if the hyena outnumber the lionesses quite a bit, yes, they will challenge the lionesses. And I have seen lionesses being chased off of a kill by a clan of hyena. If there was a male in the area, I think the chances of that happening are, are definitely, definitely far less because a big male lion won't take nonsense from a hyena and he'll probably stand up and challenge them far more than these lionesses would. And often lions, big male lions, will kill a hyena if they do get too close. But two lionesses like this, if they are outnumbered, there is a chance that they could be chased off by a hyena. A number of years ago, in 2009, 2008-2009, uh, I saw a pride of lions uh, not too far from here, also in the southern part of the of the uh, Sabi Sand Game Reserve, where we are situated at the moment. And these lionesses were on a kill one evening. And when we got there, we could see all the all the commotion that had occurred that night, and hyenas had come in challenged these lionesses and they actually what they did was they attacked one of the lionesses who tried to stand aground and fight off these hyena and with them attacking often what hyena do is they're very clever they'll work together one will go for the head and try and keep the the head and the teeth and the claws of the of the lion occupied while the other one will come around the back and try and bite the tail area or the rump and this particular lioness was bitten on the tail and they bit her tail off completely. Didn't affect her in any way. She still went on and lived a long, happy life, but she did lose her tail in that in that uh, altercation with hyena. So it just shows you, just shows you that that uh, lionesses do have to be careful, or other animals have to be careful of hyena. James has got something interesting he'd like to show you. We'll stand by and wait for you to return. There are two pigs, everybody, two pigs. One very large pig coming into screen now. There he is, fine, stout fellow. And a slightly smaller pig off behind him. Now this is a roundabout where we saw, in fact, it's exactly where we saw Sindile cross to the south yesterday. We're heading on to Arethusa. We've got an update on the radio. There is 
nothing going on there at the moment. So with any luck, we'll make our own make our own fortune on Arethusa. But I just thought it'd be very nice to relax a little bit with the piggies in the sun in the morning, especially after the sort of very unpeaceful scene of lionesses feeding on beefalo. They are lovely animals, these warthogs. And it's so interesting to me how they don't... That confiding here, especially the young boars, they tend to be much more nervous than the females. Anyway, that was the pigs. Here we are at the corner between Aratuza and uh, Juma, obviously, and Hoffmann's is down to... We often talk about Hoffmann's. That's Hoffmann's there, and that's where... Cindelia went yesterday. Um, Shadow and Cub, we don't know where they are. Nobody's seen them. Nobody's seen their tracks. So we're going to just head on to Arethusa and maybe we'll be lucky. We're going to go on to Arethusa right at the very south of where we're allowed to and see if we don't pick up either tracks of Shadow or maybe young Cindelia as well. This is exactly where he walked on and he used to hang around here when he was a youngster. Hello, John. A nice one from you. Do we use trackers on any of the animals? Well, that can mean two things. Do we use f human trackers? Yes, we do, certainly, especially when we're doing our TV shows. And just about all the tourism lodges out here have got trackers that sit on the front of the vehicle, and they'll often go off on foot and track animals. Do we use mechanical trackers or electronic trackers? No. But for on Cindela, this young 20-year-old male leopard, and that's simply because he's been reintroduced to the area, and so we need to be able to find him if we have to. And we, we get the odd ping from his collar, so we do hear about his whereabouts every so often, but we don't know all the time where he is. But none of the other animals have got tracking collars on them, and it would just, I mean, apart from being unnatural for them, I feel it would ruin some of the romance of what we do. I've no doubt one day that nostalgic view of the world will be considered totally out of date, and all of the animals out here will have subcutaneous tracking collars. There'll be some, there'll be like an, an, an iPad or something sitting on the front of the vehicle showing you where all the animals are. And uh, that's how tourism will be done. I'm pretty sure that's eventually how it will happen. But that certainly, hopefully, will never happen in my lifetime. It's rather nice not knowing what's going to be around the corner. There's some beefalo. Now, we found some buffalo there. One chap, an extremely large set of horns. And while we look there, James Richard, you say, are there any examples of interspecies communication? For example, uh, baboons and monkeys. James, yes, sometimes. Um, baboons and monkeys, not so much, but uh, I think you'll find, certainly with the alarm calls, even, I mean, interspecies is one thing, but inter, interclass, I think you'll find that many mammals will respond to bird alarm calls. They'll know exactly what they mean over the, you know, evolutionary eons, they would have figured out that understanding what a monkey's alarm call means makes a big difference to their survival. So, yes... I definitely think that happens. Is there some other form of communication? Um, uh, maybe some subtle forms of sort of almost sixth sense communication. When one animal is alarmed, uh, its body language changes. I've no doubt that animals can read each other's body language in the same way that you're able to read a dog's body language. So that would certainly be um, sort of intra... Sorry, I'm just listening to the radio quickly. No, no, we're fine. Uh, and, sorry, quick quest, quick, ah, let me just turn this down. It's starting to drive me mad. All right, so James, uh, in terms of then, like, would, would a buffalo understand an elephant's rumblings? No, I don't think it would. Would a buffalo understand a leopard's behavior were it to be stalking or were it to simply be walking past and marking territory? Yes, completely. I definitely think they would understand the difference there. 
So they read body language, they know of alarm, and I suppose there might be other more subtle things that they're able to pick up from each other, but I think those would be the main ones. Lovely sound of the white-browed scrub robin. And in the distance, beautiful call from the crested barbet. The alarm clock bird. Very nice. Pleasant in the sun here, Davy. You still got your better club on? Do. He does, yes. He looks like he's about to rob a bank. Hello, Lady Lone Wolf. Um, you, you want to know what is the most dangerous out of our big five? Lady Lone Wolf, I'm going to say a few things about that question. The first is that I find the big five the term Big Five to now be uh, fairly offensive simply because it's an old hunting term and it describes the animals that were supposedly most dangerous to hunt. Now what it's done, what the marketing gurus of the world have done is turn the Big Five into the be-all and end-all of African safari game viewing which has discounted and probably detrimentally affected the conservation status of a number of other species. For example, cheetah are not part of the Big Five. Uh, giraffe are not part of the Big Five. And nor are hippo, uh, nor are so many of the other magnificent animals that we get out here, wild dogs. And so when people come out here and say they want to see the Big Five, I think they've, you know, they've been sold a bit of a yarn by, by marketers. And I think it's a poor term, to be honest. Um, but the most dangerous well, any animal, if you attack it and corner it, is going to be dangerous. From the smallest dike, and I really mean that. I mean, I, I spoke to a chap who was a game capturer. You know, he did game capture for a living. The most terrifying experience he ever had was with a diker. So a tiny little diker which attacked him and his wife. He had to, he had to beat it off with his, with his wife's handbag. I'm not kidding you. He had to beat a diker off with his wife's handbag. Of the big five... They're all equally as dangerous as each other. If you corner one of them, they're going to give you. They're going to be in trouble. Are they? Are these buffalo dangerous? A hunter will tell you that these buffalo are terribly dangerous. I guarantee you that if I got out of the car and clapped my hands now, they'd run away. And the only reason that they are dangerous to hunters is if you shoot one or when you injure it. Well, then it's going to go and lie in a bush and wait for you. And when you come after it again, well, you can get what you basically. I mean, it's pretty easy to predict what you're going to get. So that's my take on the big five. Let's head, oh there's another buffalo, another breeding herd of buffalo crossing the road in front of us. Unfortunately that breeding herd of buffalo crossing the road in front of us probably lost one of their number at some stage during the night last night. They look to be in mourning. Let's head back to that hapless creature with the two lions and Byron. I'm not a hapless creature, James, <laughs> but <laughs> we are still sitting with these two beautiful lionesses. I hope James has a little bit more luck on Arethusa than more luck than we had yesterday afternoon down on that side. Still just the one lioness feeding and the other one still resting. It's really warmed up beautifully now. It's such a lovely morning. The gloves are off, the scarf is off. Brian is showing a little bit more face, <laughs> which is great. I think what we are going to do is we're going to leave these lionesses now. We can always come back later. As I said, I'm sure they are going to be in this area for quite some time. Still a lot of meat there. So uh, then I think, yeah, we may see them later this afternoon or later this drive. Going to head around and see what else we can find. Morning, Max. How are you? Hello, everyone. Good. I'm going to move out for you. We can have a better view. All right. Thank you very much.
beautiful warm morning, isn't it? <laughs> Enjoy everybody. There we go. I think that one lioness will feed for a little while longer and then probably also lie down. Find, find some shade. There's quite a bit of shade around for them. And rest for most of the day and then when they're hungry again, get up and feed every so often. Right, we are going to head into the area of Treehouse, Treehouse Dam. While we do that, Head over to James, who has got a live buffalo for you. No. Everybody, here are the buffalo, and um, what you saw there was a bird, and David and I were doing a bird quiz while I tried to take a picture of it. I obviously failed dismally to take a picture of it because I'm the world's slowest photographer. David, it was a fork-tailed drongo. Easily recognizable by its tail. correct, its forked tail. Well done. <laughs> and he and his friends will be following this herd of buffalo, picking up the bits and pieces that they kick up into the sand. Into the sand, out of the sand as they walk. Now, the reason I was distracted there and used the wrong preposition was. There's a Koki Franklin. Now, David, that is the bird knocking about with a bright gold head over there. You see it? Isn't it beautiful? There it is. Isn't that lovely? The best Franklin there is. My photographic skills are going to preclude me from taking a picture of it, but I'm going to try, and what we'll see is a golden blur. Just listen to the buffalo moving. I love the sound of them moving through the bush. I find it very comforting. Just the soft hoof falls and their hooves on the ground, everyone, are massively important for the ecology of an area like this. We need their hooves to break up the ground, to bury the seeds of the grass. Hugely, hugely important. Ah, David, there is one that seems to have got himself caught on a tree. He's uh, scratching his nether regions. Very nice. Yeah, well done. Not only the elephants who cause distress to the Cumbretum trees, I imagine that Cumbretum tree didn't wake up this morning, imagining it would be looking at the undercarriage of a buffalo as it walked by in the sunshine. I think that one's just a bit careless. Now the herd seems to be settling down here, so I've no doubt they've been moving around. That's quite a new one, you know, probably only about a month or so old. And they look to be settling down. I'm just going to sneak slowly forward and I'll show you what I mean. Hello, I walk in the rain. Very inappropriate name for this time of the year. Well, in this particular area. I walk in the rain, you say, where are the ox peckers? They're here. I've heard them. You'll find that there's now, I mean, now is the kind of the time of day when they'll start to arrive in greater numbers. But I can see a few. We'll try and find you some now. I'm just going to try and ease into this place here and hope that they don't move. There are some ox peckers on the back of this cow lying here. We're just going to try and move very slowly into position so that they don't freak out and run off. I'm always amazed at buffalo in this particular part of the Sabi sands because you know, we've watched, I've watched buffalo in the Sabi sand so close that a rather naughty tracker I once had, I mean, he, I've, he slapped them on the backside before they've been so close because they're so relaxed. But these chaps aren't quite, and they never have been up here. Don't really know why. Lovely. 
this shot there. And there the ox peckers are irritating irritating that buffalo cow and she seems to be settling. You see she's lying down and I think everyone else in this herd has got up during the early morning, walked about the place, devoured a whole lot of grass and you will see some of them also eat, probably eating leaves, browsing, which they wouldn't normally and then they're going to lie down and chew the cud like this cow is about to start doing now. And Dave, yeah, you could, if you just stick on that one that you've got there, yeah, eating the strychnos bush. Now, strychnos, of course, we know the fruit has got strychnine in the seeds. The leaves are not supposed to be not very toxic, but Eugene, our tech fellow, um, who's currently quaffing good wines at Betty's Bay on leave, having a good time, I hope, Eugene. He cut himself once on one of those strychnos bushes, and the cut became tremendously infected and it festered quite horribly on his arm. And so I, I imagine there is poison within those branches. But the buffalo are now in a slightly desperate state. Simply given the lack of grass. You can hear them going, has large amounts of methane being released into the atmosphere. Let's sneak a little bit forward. This feels a bit ridiculous to say you're going to sneak forward in a vehicle like this. Hello Donna, what a nice question from you. Sorry, the, the reason these, the, some of them are reacting is because the, there's a breeze blowing slightly sort of from behind us to, towards them. And they don't like that very much. Donna, you say do buffalo mourn their losses like elephants do? The obvious answer to that, Donna, is no, they don't. Do I know that to be true? Absolutely, I do not know that to be true, Donna. Um, I've, I've watched fairly emotional responses from giraffe to losing youngsters. I don't see really why buffalo should be any different. So, you know, when a mother loses a baby, they might not uh, be as, or seem as obviously uh, mourning as the elephants do because the elephants make a, a show of it. And they pick up the bones and they put them on each other's heads and they, I think they just have a, I think they have an easier way of communicating with us so that we pick it up a lot more than we would with buffalo. But I think that the motherly response to losing youngsters especially, whether they mourn losing adults, that they're close to them, I don't know. But youngsters, I think almost certainly, they feel a dreadful emotional response to losing. And I've seen it with zebra as well. It's just, you know why it's difficult to pick up is because they don't have facial expressions like us. So it's it's almost impossible. You can't read an animal's emotion from its face. You can from a dog because it'll go like that if it wants to bite you. You can from a chimpanzee. It'll do that because it's showing you its teeth to sh in the same way a dog does. Um, we smile, of course, to show our teeth. Uh, apparently, it's a sort of evolutionary throwback. But our faces are so filled with muscles that express our emotions um, that that's how we interpret each other. But a buffalo just doesn't have the musculature. So for it to be able to express an emotion with its face is almost impossible. And so while we talk about animals as not having emotions and saying, well, we don't think that they're emotional, we have no idea. It's just very difficult for us to interpret. And I mean, you've all seen an impala's face. You can't tell if an impala is feeling happy, sad, insane, mad, deeply depressed, overwhelmed with ecstaticness. I just used the word ecstaticness, David. It's not, in fact, a word, is it? What was I going for? Ecstasy. There we are. Yeah. I just didn't want you to get it before me. 
I'm sure you would have eventually. <laughs> All right, if we're going to leave these buffalo, nip on to Arethusa, see if we can find some leopard tracks. And while we do that, let's head across to Byron and find out what he's got to show you. Great that you got to see that buffalo herd with James. There's something interesting I'd like to show you quickly. That buffalo herd though that you've got, that, that James had, is possibly the herd that those lionesses may have chased. Because that calf definitely must have been in a herd, and we weren't too far from Arethusa, so that's potentially the herd that that buffalo calf came from. Let me just show you something here, which is quite interesting. Oh, out the vehicle, stretch the legs. Can you see all this dung which has been sprayed out into this bush? Now, this is very interesting, and why I say that is, and I'm not too sure if any of our viewers has got an idea of what this is from, but let me tell you quickly, this is from Hippo. And why I say it's interesting is there's no permanent body of water around very close to this area. Just shows you how far Hippo can move when they're looking for food. What they do, and the reason they do this and spray this dung all over a bush, it's territorial scent marking. So what a hippo will do is be walking along looking for some grass to feed, and they come and then they, well, they don't quite do this. They, they shake their tails, and as the tail spins or, or flicks from side to side, it, it sprays the dung over the bush, and that's to, to ensure that the, the dung is then put all over to scent mark their, their territory. And then the hippo, and I can see the tracks over here, it continued along the road and probably went off looking for some grass to, to feed on. So that is very interesting to see all the way out here. It just shows you the distances they can travel when it is very, very dry. Brian, I hope you weren't laughing at my, my hippo attempt, my, my scent marking okay. attempt. <laughs> So it's, uh, I didn't quite get that name. It sounds like Stay Back uh, asked about animal impressions and what animal impressions I can do because most of the other presenters are able to do some animal impressions quite well. Uh, trying to think now, what, what animal impressions can I do? I think I can do a lion roar. Uh, Perhaps, perhaps. Let, let, let me see if I can try impersonate a lion for you. So we, we heard those lions calling last night, so that's why it popped into my head. And it starts off, and it goes something like this. That's a lion in the distance, I think. <laughs> I'll try to think of other impersonations that I can do of animals. And now just on our southern boundary, it's, uh, the sun is out in full force. It's going to be a beautiful warm day today. And this, just with this cool breeze in the air, fresh, fresh air. It's amazing. Really, really beautiful morning. Fantastic to be out here and to be able to show you all of this. We've had a great morning with those lions and the giraffe. I was really happy to see the giraffe. We don't get many giraffe moving through these areas. Every now and then they do. It is quite thick they'd, and they also... They, they, they prefer feeding on certain, certain trees, especially a lot of the acacia that have got good nutrients in the trees, in their leaves. But, uh, but you do get a few giraffe moving through every now and then, and it was great to see that one, especially because we had the question about giraffe this morning.
So James Richard asked a question about our Facebook chat. Facebook chat. And on that chat I mentioned that I'd travelled to, to Australia and, and seen one or two zoos in Australia while I was out there. Uh, and James Richard would like to know what other destinations I've travelled to and areas I have been. Um, James Richard, I've been quite fortunate. I've travelled uh, a fair amount uh, into different areas. I've been to America when I was very young though. I'd love to go back and uh, I want to see, you know, it's funny, but I want to see the big cities. I want to see New York again and, uh, and maybe Chicago and Las Vegas. <laughs> maybe just because it's so different and I'm not used to it. So, you know, to see those places would be great. But I've been to, uh, been to London, been to Ireland. Uh, recently, I went to Croatia and Greece, which was very beautiful, very different. Uh, so I have been lucky enough to travel around a bit but I would like to travel some more. Speaking about traveling, James has been traveling on Arethusa, and I think he has a jackal for you. Now, very lucky we are indeed, everybody. A side-striped jackal, which was lurking just behind a bush. Oh, it's having a wee. Very nice. Obviously, the male of the little pair that lives around here at the southern end of the Arethusa airstrip. Isn't he lovely? And he's relaxed a bit. I nearly, I mean, I didn't nearly run him over, but we came round a bush and he was right close by. He was lying in the shade like I think he's going to do now. And he went scuttling off and then he's relaxed. His black-backed cousin tends to be quite a lot more relaxed than he is, just about all the time, much more confiding, much less nervous. And he's just decided that he should turn his fright into something useful and do a bit of a marking. And unfortunately, he's gone now south of where we're allowed to be. So while we can film him in there, we cannot get any closer to him. Hmm, but Dave can. Well done, David. Very nice. He's in very good condition. You can see he's got lovely winter fur, nice fat belly, so he's clearly finding enough in the way of rabbits and birds and the odd bit of fruit and maybe some scavenged meat. What a great sighting. I'm just wondering if he isn't going to fetch up with his partner. They're not quite as... Um, or fastidious about maintaining their pair bonds, I don't think, than the black-backed version. But there should be another one around here, and Brent has definitely seen another one around here. There he goes. Wonderful. Well done, David. Keep watching till he disappears. In fact, let me go a little back. Annie, you say you've been calling these black-backed jackals um, when you've been watching the camera at Pete's Pond. Um, Annie, are you sure they aren't black-backed jackal? Because they do look relatively similar. The black-backed just has a much blacker mantle underneath that silver mantle. So, I mean, the, marking is, the markings are similar, and if you didn't know the difference between the two, and if you hadn't seen them both, I think it would be very easy to confuse them. So, Annie, um, it would, I would be surprised if there were more black-backed jackals, at least if there were more side-striped jackals in that area than there are black-backed. I would have thought in Mashatu there would have been more black-backed. If you look, can you see him, Dave? I don't see him either. Let me just quickly show you the difference, Annie, in uh, my book, my rather special mammal book, and uh, J for jackal. I might just leave through. Here we go. So, <laughs> there, oh, that's called the common jackal, they've called it there. 
Let me just turn the page. Okay, yeah, now these pictures are really not very good, but i give you an idea here. In fact, they're slightly ridiculous, mainly because they come from all over the, all over the continent. So, sorry, let me get my earpiece back in so I can hear what's going on. So there's the black-backed, and there's the side-striped. Now that, if I mean, if you were to see the animal we've just seen and look in your field guide to see what it was, I don't think you'd ever identify it as this sort of, um, well, fairly rodent-like looking creature. Anyway, that's what we were looking at. But what you can see here is that they've both got that saddle on the back, and on the side-striped, it's just a lot paler. The black-backed, it is black and then with silver sort of overlaid on top. The big thing, Annie, to look out for is that white tip to the tail. All the side-striped jackals have got a white tip to the tail, which the black-backed do not. So if it's got a white tip to the tail, you can be almost 100% sure that it is a side-striped jackal. Canis adustus. Okay. Right, let us press on from here. Very nice. Hello, Aaron in New Zealand. You're wondering about the average litter size. Um, the average litter size of the side striped jackal, Aaron, is I think three or four. Stand by. Um, it doesn't say in this particular book. I'm going to go with three or four little pups. That's certainly what it is for the black backed, and I imagine it's probably the same. So they'll be smaller than wild dog. Uh, litters, and I suspect it can probably be up to ten, but I would imagine three or four, maybe five, is uh, is about the average. So slightly more than the cats. I will check that up for you, though. I'm not sure exactly. Uh, Margaret, you're in Kansas, and you want to know if those jackals are from the dog or the cat family. Margaret, they're unquestionably dogs. Um, they're actually more closely related to domestic dogs and wolves than are the African wild dog. And so I think there have actually been instances of interbreeding between do domestic dogs and jackals. So they are very much dogs. Canids, or from the, yeah, from the canid family, much the same as wolves. So they're nothing like cats at all. And Jim, you eat, I was just describing the diet of that jackal and saying, you know, it's probably filling itself up with a bit of a scavenged food, some uh, birds, if they can catch ground-dwelling birds, maybe the odd lizard, perhaps some fruit if there is any, and maybe, if it's very lucky, a scrub hare. I think there are probably quite a few scrub hares. You say, how much do they scavenge versus hunt or forage on their own? I think you, you will find Percentage-wise, a black a side striped jackal would probably catch, uh, I would say, about 80% of its own food. 20% scavenging. Byron has got a very short-tailed eagle to show you. That is correct, James. We do have a very short-tailed eagle. Now I am going to ask our viewers back home if they have any idea what this eagle is. It's a beautiful eagle. And every now and then when he turns to the right, you can see that very beautiful red face. Look there. You can just see that red face. One of my favorite eagles. Very, very beautiful bird. See if we can get some answers from any any of you, and if, who knows what what eagle this is, or if you ha can hazard a guess. Now these eagles like to fly very low, and they are scavengers. They do get to carcasses very quickly, often before vultures do. And I have seen vultures and other eagles follow these eagles when they are leading them to a carcass. And then once the vultures come in and start feeding these birds, then, then generally move off. 
they're, they're a bit smaller than, than a big vulture and they don't like to get into a scrap. So they fly very low, they try to get to a carcass quickly, scavenge as much as they can and then they'll move off. So our first answer is from Claude's Gate and you are 100% correct. This is a Batalia eagle. Very, very beautiful, beautiful eagle. Got a rusty brown back, black wings uh, with a bit of white on them. That red face, there's that red face again. As it turns, the light is perfect. Now, this is really great for photography. You can really get some nice pictures of this eagle up in that tree. Nice open, open branch. We've got a very rounded head. You see that? Very, very round, quite a large head. If you look closely at the bottom of the wings, and James mentioned it being a short-tailed eagle, they have got very, very short tails, and the tips of the wings actually extend beyond the tail. So those feathers that we can see hanging below the branch are actually the tips of the wings. They are not the tail. Always great to see birds of prey. Any birds, uh, I really, I, I mean, I do really enjoy any bird, but, but these birds of prey are just uh, are, are magnificent and sitting out in the open like this, probably warming himself up a little bit. Really wonderful. That is nice. Not seen a batelier perched like that for quite some time. <laughs> that was great. Really nice sighting of the batelier. Let us carry on and see what else we can find. So we've got a question about, and I think it's from X Blade, the, uh, the size of this eagle and whether or not it is larger or smaller than the bald eagle. Now I'm not entirely sure the size of the bald eagle, but my understanding is the bald eagle is a very large eagle. This is not a particularly big eagle, so I am assuming and I'm almost 100% certain that this batelier, oh look at it ruffling his feathers there, that this batelier is much smaller than a bald eagle, much smaller than a bald eagle. Bald eagle also hunts a lot of fish if I am correct and will go down to water and try and haul fish out of, out of water and around water's edges so the, the wingspan needs to be very large for it to get off off the ground and carry prey up into trees. I've not seen Batelier carrying prey up into the trees. Uh, so, so that would also cause the bald eagle to be a little bit bigger, and a little bit more powerful. That is a really beautiful view. Oh, look, there it goes. And you can see the lack of tail. And have a look. Watch how it rocks from side to side. Brian, you are amazing. You are amazing to be able to keep up with that batelier. But look how it rocks from side to side. They've got a very uneven or uneasy flight pattern. And the reason for that is because of that short tail. It makes it a bit, bit more difficult for them to balance, but it gives them quicker maneuverability when they are flying low to be able to get to, to carcasses if they are scavenging. But you could see they've got that very distinct rocking movement while they are flying. And they're very easy to identify while they, while they are flying in the sky. He posed perfectly for us there for a while. Nice to see them take off and fly, especially when uh, when I'm taking photographers out into or on safari. I really enjoy the photography too. 
And it's sightings like that that we really love because when you are... Sorry, I just thought I saw something here quickly. Give me a second. I just want to jump off and see what, what I saw. But as I was saying, with photographers, a sighting like that is wonderful because the the as the bird takes off, you, well, you first got it perching, and then as it takes off, you get those beautiful wings opening up. Great for photography. Uh, okay. Just saw a piece of, um, a bit of dung over there. It's not very fresh, and... Unfortunately, it's, it's a, a very small piece. I, I don't think I'd be able to show it to you, but it's from a porcupine. And the reason I know it's porcupine is I can see there's a lot of root and bark and plant material in the dung. It's not very big. It's about this size. Um, the ground isn't great. I can't, can't see the tracks, but I can see by the dung it is definitely a porcupine. Maybe from a night or two ago. It does look a little bit dry already. While we are carrying on looking for some wildlife, James has got a beautiful, beautiful antelope for you. Now, many of you, of course, have seen the male antelope, the male Nyala, doing their dressage dance around each other, but very few of you will know that Nyala are, in fact, adept show jumpers as well as dressage uh, sort of exponents able to do multiple equine disciplines or equestrian disciplines and what we've been watching here uh, was the female sort of and the male she was being chased by the male and they were jumping over that log sort of in a circle they would jump over it and then go around the bush and come back and jump over it again it was rather amusing to see unfortunately now they've stopped doing that the male is behind that bush there and i think he's chasing the female well, I don't know why he would be chasing her, because if she's going to be pregnant, I'm pretty sure she would have been pregnant already, because the breeding season is roughly the same as that of the impala. I don't know if you can see, Dave, this one to the right-hand side. I'm going to sneak forward. She keeps yawning. Obviously had a heavy night last night. It was a Thursday. There, that one that's browsing there. She keeps opening her mouth and yawning. Let's see if she does it again, because of course all mammals, I think, yawn. The funniest mammal to watch yawning is a dwarf mongoose. It is hilarious to watch a dwarf mongoose yawn. I don't know why, but it is. There. Here we go. That's the male there. Maybe we'll see some mating here. Should be unusual. That's why he was chasing her. She's much younger than the adult cows that are around him, though. Dirty old man. <laughs> He's definitely interested. And he's just, I don't know if you noticed there, everybody, he did that little, there, he's doing that Fleming grimace. He's testing whether she's ready to mate. And perhaps decided that she's not quite as ready as he thought at first. Brilliantly coloured, don't you think? He's an exceptionally clever colour. But so are his cohorts. Let's go back a little bit. I think they're the most beautiful antelope. They're my favourite. Hello. Don't panic. You just want to look. No touch, just look. Sighing, of course, because that was such a lovely photographic opportunity. Naturally, I missed it. Let's go 
back again behind the body bush. And there's also a little flock of guinea fowl knocking about on the ground. And everything, I say this just about every time, every day at this time, things are warming up and calming down. That expectation of the early morning is sort of dissipating into the settled peace of the mid-morning. David, I'm going to take a world-class photograph now. Yes, I'm sure you do. I'm sure you feel your day would be immeasurably improved by it. Hello, Aaron. Nice question from you. Utterly horrendous photograph. Um, you say, what is the diff size difference between this and a mountain in Nyala? Well, a mountain in Nyala occurs in Ethiopia, and I will get its mass for you immediately. The mass of one of these a big bull is about, well, I think he's about 130 kilograms. The mass of a female is probably just shy of that. Um, let me go and check. The tragulated antelope. Very... Uh, famous, magnificent family. Mountain Nyala weighs up to 300 kilograms a male, and uh, so that is what? That's 660 pounds. In a female, up to 200 kilograms, which is about 440 pounds, so that's quite a lot. And let me just confirm that I'm correct about our Nyala. Yes, male up to 140 kilograms here. So almost half, only half the size, and in some cases less than half the size of a mountain nyala. Unlikely to see a mountain nyala here. Maybe when we go to Ethiopia. David, you getting warming up there? David's taking off a layer or two, everyone. It's not an elephant sitting on the back of the car. Matthew, you're in Michigan and you want to know, it's a, actually a discussion that we could have for days, Matthew, but I won't keep you for days. Um, you want to know if animals will mate even if it's not breeding season and why, and you know, under what sort of conditions. Well, Matthew, the, it's, it's interesting because, no, uh, you know, these animals will not mate unless it's breeding season. And that's because the females don't ovulate. They don't come into heat. They're not ready to mate unless... It is the correct breeding season. Now, the reason for that, of course, or the reason they only mate at one time of the year, is so that when their babies are born, they're, you know, they're sufficient for them to eat. Now, in species where that isn't the case, and our own species is a classic example of that, human beings, there is no obvious mating time with human beings. And that's because what estrus is hidden. So I know that sounds a little bit sort of uh, animalistic to say, but with human beings, estrus is hidden. It means that you can't, um, you can't tell when a, when a female human being, just by looking at her, is receptive to mating or not, or is receptive or is able to conceive. Now, on most animals, you can. And it's a, it's a kind of continuum. So, for example, if, an, if a Nyala is an estrus and she's ready to breed, she'll urinate and the male will be able to tell, he'll smell the urine, he'll be able to pick it up, and then that sets off a trigger, which will in, induce, you know, he, he, will, he will then prepare himself to mate and they will mate. And that happens the same with lions and it happens with leopards and it happens with just about all the animals out here. In the case of a baboon, when a baboon's ready to mate, what she does is her entire back end turns pink. Now they will mate, she will only mate when, when she's ready to mate then. Uh, she won't mate um, with a male, or she, no, no, she won't conceive unless she's ready to mate, but she will mate with a male. 
and baboons mate with each other all the time. Now, the closer you get to human beings from, say, Nyala, so we've got to baboons, when you get to chimpanzees, that estrus is completely hidden. So a male has absolutely no idea when a female is, re is receptive to mating or not, and it's the same with human beings. And so in a, in a very kind of long-winded way, yes, anim some animals will mate out of mating season, or, or, uh, because mating season is basically when the females are prepared to conceive, but most will not, the primates being a very notable exception to that. Nice question, thank you for that. The Nyalas have headed off into this very peaceful morning. I took three or four utterly horrendous pictures, will be, which will be deleted on my arrival home. All right, let's go across to, to Byron. He is lost. Great that James got to show you that in Yala. That's one of my favorite antelope in the area. Very beautiful with those prominent white stripes down the body. And I understand the male was trying to chase the female. Isn't that the story of our lives? <laughs> We have been driving around in search for any activity. We had a, a daker which stood for about a minute and ran off just before we could show you. They are very shy little antelope and they don't, uh, they don't hang around for too long. What we're going to do is try head towards where tell a water hole and see if there's any activity around there. Maybe some good bird life. So Betty has asked me a question and she would like to know what animal I think James resembles the most. Oh dear, this is, <laughs> this is playing with fire Betty, I'm not sure. Okay, let me think, uh, James, <laughs> I don't know if you heard that, I think you did it, Brian thinks a crowned lapwing. So, <laughs> He's, James is built like a steenbok, very, very, very slim and agile. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm trying to think. He is. Uh, to be honest, I think James resembles an owl, and I'll tell you why. Um, so I think the thin legs, definitely, but uh, but he's got a very calm nature about him most of the time and and James is very wise He's one of the the most intelligent people I know and he's a good friend of mine but I think I think he resembles an owl you know he kind of sits in you can ask him something he'll give you advice and uh, and then he <laughs> I just see like we saw that giant eagle owl the other day and when they sit and they blink very slowly and uh, James often does that, so maybe it looks like an owl, or resembles an owl. <laughs> Wise old James. You need to ask James a question about his touch rugby experience with me a few years ago. James is at Arethusa uh, Waterhole now, why don't you go have a look and see what he has got there. There's a bit of a depressing sign here, everybody. It's, we've got, of course, hippopotamus there that you can see. And all around it, all those kind of uh, snaky bits in the water, well, those are catfish. And they're in the last bit of water. It's not very deep. In fact, it's it's pretty shallow in there. And I think they're probably having a dreadful, dreadful time. Look at them all. I mean, there are hundreds of them slithering about. It's a boiling cauldron of a fairly miserable catfish and one hippopotamus. Yeah, well, that is the way it is with droughts. 
can't believe how full this dam was when I started almost or just over a year ago. But them days is over, them balmy days is is now done. Very nice of Byron to call me an owl. I like owls very much. I'm not sure the reasons for his calling me an owl are necessarily uh, very complimentary. Um, Byron, I suppose, I would consider a buffalo, actually. Um, I'm trying to think. He's a, he's, a, he's a fairly large fellow, you know. He's quite well-muscled. He, um, he's been known to charge in every so often. I hear me, Good morning. Do you? Thank you very much. Please keep watching us every day and tell all your friends and even your enemies. <laughs> Enjoy. That's very sweet. It's always nice to see people who watch us. So, Byron is a buffalo, I think, yes. Mus muscly fellow. Uh, he's a, he, he, he likes to charge in every so often, um, sometimes not in the most considered fashion. There he is, you see? If you've ever seen Byron on a rugby field, you'll know exactly what I mean. He turns into a raging buffalo. Byron has also quite worked, worked quite hard at cultivating a um, an aura of sort of um, certainly when he was younger, not not anymore. When he was younger, he he cultivated this aura of of macho ness that he he liked to cultivate, and he he didn't like to let on that he actually has a quite an amazing general knowledge. He liked to play dumb every so often, didn't like to appear too intelligent in front of people, lest they think he was intellectual. <clears throat> that herd of buffalo that we saw earlier is now coming down towards the water. They're coming in a cloud of dust. We'll just move down in front here and have a look at them, and then I think we'll start to make our way for bacon and eggs, David. Bacon and eggs today? Yes, very nice, delicious. All right, let's go back to, we're gonna wait here for the buffalo. Let's go back to Byron and a monkey herd. A monkey herd? Troop, troop, troop of monkeys. Thank you for calling me a buffalo, James, or, or, <laughs> or comparing me to a buffalo. So we have got a monkey, and it just looks like one vervet monkey, not velvet, vervet. Uh, and he's just in the top of the uh, tree at the moment, kind of hiding from us. Uh, only he's by himself. I don't see any others around, which is quite strange, I'm sure. But you do get sentinels within a troop of, of monkeys like this. Uh, probably one having a look out while the rest are feeding somewhere on the ground behind us. And maybe he's come to have a look to see if it is safe at the water hole for him to come down and drink. They do come down to drink at water. Let's see if I can reposition quickly, see if we can't have a quick glimpse of him. Up in this tree. I can try my monkey impersonation, my vervet monkey impersonation. That's an alarm call of a vervet monkey. There he is, there he goes. Oh, all the way up there. Jumping around there, you can see him clearly. Bit of banging behind us. It's just, uh, I think they're doing a bit of maintenance at the Vuyatela Lodge. It's fixing something there quickly. This monkey still hiding from us. We're going to move on from the water hole now and go and move around a little bit, see if we can't find something else. While we do that, James has a large herd of animals which resemble me. <laughs> Here we are with a large herd of Byron walking past. I'm sure Byron's parents would be too pleased that I'd compared him with a buffalo. 
but they are rather good animals, I think. Very nice. They're all going down to have a little bit of a drink now. As the heat starts to build, and as I've said to you, of course, many times before, they do need to drink often if they're going to survive the dry season, and that's not so much because the water, you know, helps them with the dryness. The water really does help their digestive systems. This is wonderful. Brilliant sighting of buffalo. They're really coming quite close to us now, and like I said to you earlier, they don't really like that. Fantastic, kicking up the dust. Marvellous. Couple of them running. Be nice to see some lions, obviously, sort of chasing them from behind, but I mean, this isn't bad. Delightful sound of the angle grinder at Arethusa, infusing the low felt morning. <laughs> These lodges, of course, have many things, many repairs and things that they have to do all the time. And so that's perfectly normal. Just in case you were wondering what that sound was. Hello, Kim in South Carolina. Nice one from you, you say. How many people live in the areas that we traverse? Kim, um, none on the actual reserve, but outside the reserve, many. There are about four and a half million that live on the borders of the Kruger National Park, uh, but none, no, no villages inside the park other than staff and uh, sort of conservation staff and tourism staff and, and that sort of thing and administration staff. But there are no actual sort of permanent settlements, if you like, within the Kruger National Park. Very, they look a bit morose and forlorn, I must say. But you know, they're maintaining condition quite well. Buffalo will start to lose condition towards the end of the dry season. And I mean, some of them are start. you can see their hips already. And so you'll be able to pick up, when they start to lose their uh, condition badly, you'll be able to pick it up immediately. They are, they are starting to look a little bit ropey at this stage. And you can tell that from the back hips sticking out. That chap looking at you on the right-hand side of your screen is going to have a very impressive set of horns one day. They're very large for a fellow of his size. And some of them are stopping to look at us. Others have made it down to the water. Let me just flick round. It's going to reverse slightly. Try not to freak them buffaloes out, and then we can see them going down to have a drink. I'm very glad I don't have to drink this water. The elephants will almost certainly reject this water out of hand because it's full of catfish, catfish dung, catfish detritus, buffalo dung. Ah, now Donald. Very nice question from you about the catfish and whether or not the animals will start to take advantage of them. Yes, there will be a few, certainly, Donald, and uh, birds largely. I think you're going to find a big dissension eventually of marabou storks are going to come into this area, possibly some fish eagles, and I think also once it gets really dry, hyenas will go in there and take them out. You might even find uh, young leopards who are really hungry going in there and taking the odd catfish out. Very peaceful. 
except for the angle grinder. <laughs> yeah, well, so it goes. All right, everyone, I think we're going to leave these beefies to go down to the water and have a drink, and we're going to head for home to have our breakfast. Let's see, quickly, I just want to leave before the end of drive because I want to see if there aren't perhaps some tracks of shadow or some dealer on our way out. I've taken rather longer than I'd hoped to get to this area. All right, while we do that, let's head across to Byron, find out what beefy Byron has managed to find. <laughs> I have found something for you. I'm just trying to get to it. Uh, there's a road. I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. Wonderful to see a big herd of buffalo with James, though. It's always great. Let's have a look here. Off, just off to the left, we have a beautiful elephant bull just moving around by himself. There he goes. Oh, he's going back to the main road. Brian, let's ride around quickly and see if we can't get a view on the other side. He seems very, very intent. I've just got a glimpse of him through there. Very intent on moving through this area quite quickly. Might get him crossing. I don't know if he's crossed already. No, there he goes. Straight ahead. Oh. Walking very quickly. <laughs> How's that for timing? Fantastic. <laughs> oh, let's just see where he's going. It doesn't look like he wants to hang around for us to, for too long. There he is, just off to the left. quite quickly. Possibility is heading into an area um, where you can find some water. But it is still quite far from the Vuyatela waterhole. So unless he knows of another smaller waterhole where he could potentially find find something to drink. Nevertheless, always great to see an elephant passing through. Just shows you how quickly they can disappear into the thickets. Look at that. I mean, across the road and he's gone. If you were driving past now, I doubt you would be able to see him. I mean, I can't see him now. Just getting a bit of movement there. And he's gone. But what a nice surprise. Beautiful elephant bull. It didn't look like a big dominant bull. Younger, younger bull. But uh, nevertheless, he's on his way. Let's move up onto the clearings of quarantine and see what uh, what is around there. Maybe have some antelope or, or something out in the open. Not too far from that area. Beautiful marula trees up around this this clearing. It's a pity it's not summer. I'd love to go and pick up the marula fruit and eat them in summer. They really are quite tasty. That's why I think animals like those elephants, they love, they love them. They feed on those constantly. Let's see if we can spot anything around here. Nice open clearing. I'm sure in summer you get a lot of animals frequenting this area. Oh, there we go. Three large bovine. There's some buffalo. Not quite as many as you had with the herd with James. 
But it's always nice to see these buffalo. These are three, or oh, no, four. Four old buffalo bulls just enjoying the sun and ruminating. If you have a look at that, that big one, especially to the back, uh, the back one, there we go, Brian, that one. Ruminating, enjoying a last bit of food. Well, it's been a fantastic morning with all of you. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. So nice to be able to see the lion, elephant. It's a nice, cool morning, warming up beautifully. Really, really great. So thank you very much to Brian and the thumb. <laughs> what a great morning. Always great to drive around with you. Thank you to the ladies in FC, and thank you for all the questions this morning. Um, we will see you this afternoon. Have a wonderful Saturday, everyone. Let's cross over to James, and he will say goodbye for the morning. We're just leaving Arethusa now, everybody, and I have not found any evidence of leopards. So maybe we'll try the northern reaches today. I may head back to Cheetah Plains. In fact, we might send Byron to Cheetah Plains to explore this afternoon. It was just the most wonderful afternoon we had there yesterday with all those elephants and zebras. Maybe some delay will pop out and maybe he won't. But what we can be sure about is that the afternoon will be very beautiful and well worth a visit. And until then, we are going to be enjoying our time at home. Today for me is a photograph deleting day. It's always a slightly dejecting time of my life. All right, thank you, David, for your efforts today. A big thank you to all of you for your chats. We had a lovely time warming our mouths as we spoke. And of course, to beefy Buffalo Byron, and uh, being filmed by the not-so-beefy Brian. Thank you to them. And the final control of Kirsten and Rebecca. Until 3 o'clock this afternoon, stay safe and happy wherever you are. Bye-bye. <laughs>